so, uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 38 and 39. Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you will, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. Uh, earlier this week, just a few days ago, I sent uh, an email and text to parents and grandparents. We have kids and grandkids in our church. And I was pleading with you to make sure your kids and you are in church today. I, I want to preface my comments with this statement. I, I believe that this sermon that's been birthed in my spirit is the most important sermon I've ever preached in the history of our tenure at this church. That's how important this is to my heart. I want to speak on the subject of perpetual Pentecost. Amen. He says, in verse number 38, Peter says, let, us, or let every one of you be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. When he says for the remission of sin, he says you're being baptized because you've already been forgiven of your sin. You're not forgiven of your sins because you're baptized in water. You're baptized in water because you have given your life to Jesus Christ. Amen. And he goes on and says, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. As I stated in our message last week, when a person gives their life to Jesus Christ, at the moment of salvation, the Holy Spirit takes residence in our life. He moves into your heart. The devil is kicked out. The sins are forgiven, and they are removed as far as the east is from the west. And so the Holy Spirit takes residence in our heart for the benefit of many fold, but one of those is that when you give your life to Christ, you are saved completely. He doesn't save you in parcel and part. He saves you completely. You are saved in, in the eyes of God. But there's this issue called progressive sanctification or consecration. And so the Holy Spirit moves in our heart, and every day He is drawing us to be ever closer Amen. to the Lord. So yes, it's instant sanctification, and yes, it's progressive sanctification. And he is drawing us every single day into a closer walk with Jesus Christ. After that experience of salvation and the Holy Spirit moving in, there is an experience subsequent to that, or after that, that's called the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And uh, so the Holy Spirit moves in for consecration and guidance and so many other things. But the baptism of the Holy Spirit, according to Acts 1 and other passages, that baptism is for power, for service. And Peter here seems to be, be relating. He said, this is, you will receive this gift or this promise from the, Holy, from the Holy Ghost. He seems to be relating this experience to a promise Jesus spoke of in Acts chapter 1, verse 4. He says, were well, you supposed to go to Jerusalem? You tarry there until you receive the promise of the Father, and you will be my witnesses. So J Peter is reminding them of a statement Jesus made just barely two weeks prior to this, when he says, you're going to receive the promise of the Father. You're going to be baptized. You're going to have power. Well, Jesus is make, reminding a promise that actually originated in the book of Joel chapter 2. 800 years before the birth of Christ came this promise in Joel chapter 2. I'm going to pour out my spirit on all flesh, upon your sons and your daughters, upon old men and young men, upon your mid-servants and your maid-servants. I'm going to pour out my spirit in those days. Now listen to me, beloved. This week, our young people, our students are going to youth camp. And I, when I was a student with um, Assembly of God Theological Seminary, going through my master's work, I, I, was, I was enrolled in a class called Current Trends in Pentecostal Theology. And as a part of that class, I did a research um, paper. And when I came back from the class and I started in this research, I contacted our district office. And I said, I would like the names and the contact information of all of our ministers in our network. There are over 500 Assemblies of God, credentialed Assemblies of God ministers in our network of Colorado and Utah. There are 160 churches. There are over 500 uh, licensed credentialed ministers. I contacted many of them, and I either spoke to them privately or I, I sent to them a questionnaire. And the question I asked them was this. 
tell me the time and the location, the circumstances around which you were baptized in the Holy Spirit, and when you first recognized you had a call of ministry in your life, the vast majority of them recognized summer youth camp as a time when they were baptized in the Holy Spirit and as a time when they first began to recognize God had placed a call of ministry on our lives. Now, I know that youth pastors and the church workers are no substitute for the mama's prayers and the daddy's instructions. Uh, but I, I want to tell you this. It is the sacred duty of the church to maintain spiritual vitality, moral purity, and sound teaching for our young people. Believers who have experienced salvation and baptism in the Holy Spirit, who have known the grace and the mercy of God and have knowledge of biblical truth, I believe have a solemn obligation to pass that on to the very next generation. We must strive to preserve and propagate this doctrine. Can you give me an amen? amen. Now here it is. There is an ever-widening gap between the early church Pentecostals and the current Pentecostal church. I want to speak to you about two movements. One is the charismatic movement and the other is the Pentecostal movement. Both the charismatic movement and the Pentecostal movement were, were born out of Protestantism. They believe, we believe in salvation through Jesus Christ. We believe in the inerrancy of God's word. Both Christians, both Charismatic and Pentecostals, emphasize the work of the Holy Spirit in their lives. And they emphasize the importance of the gifts of the Spirit in everyday part of their life. But I want to talk to you quickly about some slight differences between the Charismatic movement and the Pentecostal movement. Now, there been the, Pente the Charismatic movement has brought some incredibly wonderful and exciting things. But there are some subtle differences between the two. Let me identify. Many of the charismatic churches that I'm connected with and I know, they speak, that they teach that speaking in tongues is no longer the initial physical evidence of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. And there are some individuals that have started being connecting to our church that are trying to teach this doctrine in our church. Can I tell you, the Pentecostals teach that the speaking in tongues is the initial physical evidence of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. That has been our doctrine. It remains our doctrine. And we're not going to change it to accommodate a few. Are you with me? There's another subtle difference. Another subtle difference. And that is many of the charismatic, again, I'm speaking of my own personal context, many of the charismatic churches I'm familiar with are non-denominational or independent. They're not a part of a, of a denomination. And the problem with that is if you're not a part of a denomination, who are you accountable to? You see, when you're a part of a denomination, we are part of the Assemblies of God denomination, which means that we are accountable to those in the Assemblies of God denomination. And I think there is something wonderful to be associated with an organization that's older than us and larger than us. You with me? There is value in being connected to an organization that is larger than us and smarter than us. The great spiritual reformers in church history were moved by a need to refine and protect the purity of the doctrine and to hold firm to the spiritual experience that made the church or the denomination necessary to begin with. And when you study reformers like Luther and Calvin and Wesley, you will learn that they were deeply rooted and committed to the purity of the doctrine. Listen to me. The word orthodoxy is not a bad word. The word orthodoxy simply means tenet or belief or accepted view. There is a Pentecostal orthodoxy that was established by the faith of our Pentecostal fathers. Pentecost is both a doctrine and it is an experience, and we need credibility on both ends. If we're going to be an Assemblies of God congregation, let's be Pentecostal for the sake of our students and our children. History shows that each, again, this is part of my research, history shows that each succeeding generation of Pentecostals has moved farther from the early day Pentecostal revival that gave birth to this great fellowship. Yeah. 
In fact, history shows that in every denomination that I've researched, always begins this downward spiral in the third generation. Because the first generation is the generation of the experience. The second generation were the kids of those who had the experience. And the third generation are those who have only heard about it. Second point of my message is this. We must renew our Pentecostal experience regularly. Regularly. Go back to your text in Acts 2.39. He said, this promise is to you. This promise is to you. This promise is to you. How many of you know a promise is only as good as the one who makes it? This promise comes from God himself. This promise is to you. This promise is to you. Listen to me. Peter was saying to everyone in that audience, every one of you can be saved and every one of you can be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And I'm looking at an audience today and I'm looking into the camera of those who are going to be viewing this online and I'm telling you, everyone can be saved and everyone can be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Listen to me, beloved. This is the heart of your pastor that's speaking out. We should not have to be coerced or begged to get into an altar. Right. Come on. Right. That's right. I'm old enough to remember a commercial of Wolf Brand Chili. How many remember Wolf Brand Chili? They had a tagline on the end of it. How long has it been since you had a big steaming bowl of Wolf Brand Chili? <laughs> well, that's too long. I would say to the Pentecostal church, how long has it been since we experienced the fire of God in our altars? Well, that's just simply too long. Acts 2.39, this promise is to your children. Your children. That's your child. But it is also descendants in future generation. From the earliest days, children have been highly prized. In the Old Testament, children were important to perpetuate the family, the tribe, and the nation. You go back and you study the Abrahamic covenant at the core of the covenant from God to Abraham. He says you're going to have children. In fact, children are going to have children. And there are going to be future generations of children. And so many children that in the end you're not going to be able to count them all. And parents were the primary responsibility for training and educating the child. Tutors were sought out only by the few who could afford them. History shows, listen, history shows a direct correlation between the rise of paganism and the breakdown of the home. It's the truth. Rise in paganism is associated to the breakdown of the home. Where you have the weakening influence of parents upon children. And when you have weakening influence of parents upon children, you have a rise in disobedience to parents. And a rise in paganism. Verse 39, this promise is to you, your children, and to all who are far off. Peter's not just talking about those who were there, and you have kids who live in far off countries. He's talking about those who live in far off generations. This promise is to you and to all who are afar off. The promise of salvation and spirit baptism was not limited to the first century church, but is available for generations today. And in spite of teachings of men like John MacArthur and Warren Wearsby, who teach that they don't doubt that the, the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit took place in the first century church, they just say it's not for this century today. They are in the doctrine we call dispensationalists. So if you're studying study notes from John MacArthur or Warren Wearsby and others who are trying to teach on the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you're, listen, you're reading the notes of someone who believes it is not for our generation today. Peter said it's for all who are afar off. We need to come to these altars as an example for our children and our students. We ought to accompany our children to these altars. Hear my heart. May God have mercy upon the adult who sits like a bump on a log and cannot get themselves out of a seat and get down to an altar and pray with others. May God have mercy upon the adult who can walk out of a church when there are kids and others who are in the altars and they are tearing for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We need a generation of kids 
who see and hear their mama and daddy and grandma and grandpa pleading out and interceding for this generation. Third point. We must teach our children fervently. I want you to go to Psalm 78. I want you to go to Psalm 78. He says in verse number 3, our forefathers taught us by precept and example. He says in verse number 3, we have heard and we have known. Our fathers told us. We have heard. We have known. Our fathers have told us. We have to tell our children and our grandchildren. Amen. I want you to hear me hard. Too many of us have lost kids and grandkids. Not only in church, we've lost our kids and grandkids to non-Pentecostal churches. Now, they can still get to heaven, but they're not going to know about the gifts of the Spirit. They're not going to know about the doctrine of divine healing. Come on, my friends. He says, our fathers told us. This is the daddy and it's a mama who speaks life into their kids. Listen to me, mom and dad. Silence can be a powerful teacher. Yeah, that's true. Verse 4, we will not hide them from their children. We will not hide them from their children. Them speaks to verse number 1, the law of God. Yeah. Verse number 3, the parables and the dark sayings of old. Verse number four, telling them or showing them to the next generation to come the praises of our Lord. We have to demonstrate to this next generation the praises of our Lord. He says, we know these things because our fathers told about us. Some years ago, Gina and I were privileged to, we were invited by Focus on the Family to participate in a study group. Focus on the Family was doing research. They were wanting to write a, a, a magazine for, par- uh, for kids whose parents are in ministry. And so they invited, I think there were 10 of us who came to a place in downtown Denver. I, I, to my knowledge, we were the only Pentecostal family there. They, had, they, they did their homework. They had ministers from all different denominations there. And one of the questions, because they were wanting to address issues, challenges that PKs deal with. And one of the questions was this. Tell us one of the greatest challenges that PK, PK's pastor's kid has to deal with. And my wife spoke up. If, <laughs> how many know she's smarter than me? <laughs> she really is. Yeah. Yeah. How many know I'm, I'm mar- Mike, I'm married way out of my league. <laughs> well, you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. But Gina spoke up and she said, it's not all challenge. There are great blessings that the kids receive when they're in the home of a par- in a parsonage. Well, I grew up in the home. Mom and dad were pastors. My dad was an educator. And I got to thinking back when she made this statement, my heart leapt within me. And I began to replay in my mind recordings of conversations I had. I remember sitting down with James Bulware. James Bulware is a name that is esteemed in this network. He's in heaven now, but he was one of our statesmen of this district for years. And I sat down with Brother Bulware, and I said, Brother Bulware, would you and Virginia just talk to us and reminisce a bit about the early days? I remember sitting down and talking to a few others. I remember one time when, in 1989, I think it was, we were associate pastors at Praise Assembly, in uh, praise of, uh, in, in Pueblo, in the opening, our church was large enough that we could host the district council. So we hosted district council, and the the, open, the speaker of the opening service was Dr. T. F. Zimmerman, former general superintendent of the Assemblies of God United States, and was president of the Assemblies of God International. This was the the key guy of the Assemblies of God worldwide. He preached that night. He was well up in years, way past retirement. You know, I was tasked with the responsibility of getting him back to his hotel. And so I, I, I get him to my car that was parked right outside one of the side doors. I get him in his car. I get him in a seat. I come around, and I get in the driver's seat, and he says, so your last name is Brummett. I said, yes, sir. Are you related to H.A. and Pat Brummett? I said, H.A. My, is my dad, and Pat's my mom. 
He said, I remember when God healed your mother of cancer in the late 70s. How's Pat doing? I thought, this man has met thousands, tens of thousands of people. And he remembered a time of a, over a decade ago when God healed my mom of cancer. And so he and I had a, just a good old chat. Uh, Dr. Z, dad called him Dr. Z uh, uh, and others. I remember talking to one of our one of retired ministers at the time. I said, I need you to reminisce with me. Go back and tell me the early days. He said, oh, man, I remember when my wife and I went up to the northwest, Washington or, or uh, Oregon, and we were we decided we were going to go plant a church. And what we did is we hit the small town, and we just uh, had an accordion and a guitar and stood on the street corner and started singing. And crowd gathered around. We got to preaching, and we birthed the church. He said, in that particular church, he said, I had people throwing eggs at us. I had people throwing tomatoes at us. He said, well, we started service. And we noticed in the evening, only women were coming. So I got to find out what's going on. He said, well, that was loggers. That was logging industry. And all the men were up in the hills working and logging. And they never come home on the weekend. He said, we started church first of the week. And all these women started coming. They get saved one night. They'd go home and clean out the cupboards from all the alcohol. They'd empty the cupboards of all the alcohol. They'd come back the next night and they'd get baptized in the Holy Spirit. By the end of the week, these gals are saved and baptized in the Holy Spirit. The husbands come down from the hills. And they go to the cupboards and the alcohol is gone. And they said, where's my alcohol? Oh, we got rid of it. Why? We've been going to church. Where? Well, this preacher started a church. I've been baptized. I've been saved. I've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. So these guys went to the local bar, and they got to tell them the story and found out every one of their wives was saying the same thing. We got saved. We got baptized in the Holy Ghost. We don't need that stuff anymore. So these guys got all liquored up, and they said, we're going to go find this preacher. We're going to kill him. We're going to get rid of him. We'll get him out of town. They became so liquored up. And they became angry at each other and they fought against each other. <laughs> but he said a church was born. Yeah. There's something. There's something about hearing from your parents and your grandparents. Here's the objective, verse 6 and 7 of Psalm 78. That the generation to come might know them, that the children, that the children, that the children who would be born, that they may arise and declare them to their children, that they may set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments, that the generation yet born... I was reading this week some old sermons of my dad. And I ran across one sermon. And I borrowed the title of his sermon for this one, Perpetual Pentecost. I didn't steal his notes. (laughs) But I read them. (laughs) And the spirit of that sermon was birthed. In my spirit. I read a statement that my dad wrote. The close. The close of a sermon. And I am stealing that. I'm going to share with you. And I have it on the screen. Here's what dad wrote. Ours is a generation of grammar without grace. Of eloquence without ethics. We are producing a generation of religion without righteousness. Offspring who accept only the part of God's word which does not reprove an ungodly lifestyle. It is time to return to the faith of our founding fathers of Pentecost. It is time to rekindle the fires on the altar so that children and students may see and hear. It is time that our children find adults in the altars and experience for themselves the baptism of fire. Thanks, Dad. It's time. You shouldn't have to be begged or coerced to get into an altar. We're going to come and we're going to pray for a couple of things. We're going to pray for kiddos that are at youth camp this week. 
that are saved, that are baptized in the Holy Spirit. And we're going to pray for additional workers that are going to birth in their spirit. You know what grieves me is on Wednesday nights, we have a good, we have a good Bible study and prayer time in here. We have a support team. Uh, uh, it's called Celebrate Freedom. That's in the fellowship hall. We have youth going on on Wednesday nights. We have a group of, of young girls that are exciting. It's called the Fun Club, and they do have fun. But week after week, we're struggling to get any boys. And it's not because of a lack of commitment or dedicated workers. We need a generation of boys to become Daniels, Shadrach, and Meshach. We need some people get a, going to get a hold of an altar. And we're going to pray in an army of boys into this church. I'm going to tell you who the three smartest boys in this city are. Are the three boys that are going to youth camp because there's ten girls from our church that are going. <laughs> well, it ain't a bad reason. Just saying. It's time to change the current. It's, chine, it's time to change the tide. I'm praying for an army. And I don't want to stand alone. Altars are open. Come on.